the combination of those two is key. And Strahd, do, do you, the Vice President Kagame is now Chairman of the African Union, you have a very pan-African perspective. I mean, what, what's your answer to that question? Because you see the cultural differences in different parts of Africa, different countries. How does Rwanda stick out? Well, you know, we do business in, in almost 30 African countries. We have boots on the ground, actual people there. They're not sending stuff. Tanzania, Burundi. We've got people in just about every country in this region. So we, while I'm not here to make comparisons, because that, you know, that wouldn't be right, but I can point out what makes our business case in Rwanda easy. Uh, one, Rwanda is incredibly efficient when it comes to uh, the, the business environment, the regulations, the speed, that they, they, the, their size has made them nimble. They've taken advantage of their size, the effect of being nimble. They are quick. Well, they, they know that if they're not quick, you know, get out of the tape, <laughs> boy next door, yeah. and the boy on the other side. So if you have a, a big boy, you make sure you are uh, uh, it's, it's easy to layers of bureaucracy to talk to the right and it's, it's, it's amazing how quickly they adapt to ideas okay when you can uh, from the point at which you present an idea Story. I bumped into the president in New York at a conference. The was kind of, I think it was on a and uh, in the middle of the night, a phone call. She said to me, we had a conversation with the president about this issue. So said, where are you? She said, um, what time is it there? She said, I want to make sure that if the president asks me in the morning, I have an answer. <laughs> I said, well, I need to get some sleep. <laughs> If no one owes us a living, that's the thing you've got to bear in mind. No one owes you a living. If you don't go out there and fight for your peace and your space, then the big boy will take it off the table. So, so Rwanda is, they are agile. So if you had to look for a competitive advantage of Rwanda, I would say agility, the speed at which they are willing to take on new ideas, to try new frontiers, that has to be good in a disruptive world. I think that what maybe entrepreneurial countries have in common is the ability to turn disadvantage into advantage. Uh, the, 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 those difficult circumstances actually become sort of the engine of innovation. Um, and actually, I'm curious what you think on, a, on an African level, Africa can turn disadvantage to advantage. And the, the process that this happens in, in a massive way is when you have a leapfrog. When you have uh, this continent went from not having landlines directly to cell phones, not having desktops going directly to smartphones, uh, and, and so on, 
while I was here in this visit, I went out about an hour from Kigali to see how drones are delivering blood. It's the first place in the world that's building a national blood delivery system to hospitals using drones. And it's not a coincidence that this is the first country because of the kind of leadership, the kind of ability to move quickly. You know, the United States will probably be fooling around with regulations for another few years before they can do anything like this. Yeah. So what, what do you think, what, what kind of leapfrogs do you see uh, coming or possible now? Do you want to go up first, Prime Minister? You can go first. Oh, thank you. Well, so uh, as you know, you, you, you made an interesting, there's an interesting expression you just gave, which is an entrepreneurial nation. Okay? Rwanda has to move to being a fully entrepreneurial nation in which everybody is functioning as an entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is not being a businessman or a businesswoman. It is a way of thinking. It is a way of tackling challenges that face us. Whether, whether it, we are, you are a policymaker, how, how, because, for example, it was entrepreneurial to allow a drone player. There are people who, you know, I remember, we've got a little company that does drones, but I remember discussing it with our guys, and I said, drone, they said, don't use that word, don't use that word, because no one will allow us anywhere if we use drones. They'll think we're coming to attack the country. So, okay, so it's so, an unmanned aerial vehicle. <laughs> 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 you know, but it is a, it's a tool from which we can do extraordinary things, you know. Artificial intelligence is coming. We've got biotechnologies, we've got... So Rwanda, because it's entrepreneurial, it appreciates the fact that you can allow somebody to do something as dramatic as delivering blood with a drone. Because in, in most countries, you would start first with a fight over the drone, then you'd fight with the guys over the blood and how is it human blood when it arrives with the drone? You know, there are people, you know, we could have endless regulatory battles, but from what they have done here, imagine what scaling and learning you can do from there. And you guys, I mean, you, you talk to us, but we'd like to throw questions back to you. You know, Israel, you have the largest startup concentration outside Silicon Valley. How is that possible? What did you do? What can you tell us? So, it's a long story. <laughs> We've got time. But, We've got time, uh, right? <laughs> you want to hear this long story? Yeah, you, so, we've got time. Tell us. <laughs> no. uh, I think it starts with the fact that Israel is a startup. And people throw out this word. You're calling a country a startup. That's right. Um, <laughs> Did you hear that? Are you willing to be called a startup nation? <laughs> Start up. Go on. So when when I when I when I say Israel's a startup, I don't I don't just mean that it started. You know, there are it's many young countries. Uh, everything starts at some point. But what makes a startup? What, a startup begins with an idea. And if any of you, I hope many of you are entrepreneurs and you start talking about your idea, everyone will tell you it's a bad idea because people don't like new ideas. If they did it, someone would have done it already. Most new ideas sound bad to most people. So the idea of recreating a, a Jewish state after 2,000 years was a crazy idea. Nobody thought it was a good idea. So it took a lot of drive and determination and willingness to take risk to turn that idea into a reality. I think it's important to understand that ideas are not worth much. 
It's all about what you add to them to turn them into reality. We all have ideas, but it's the entrepreneur who adds those two ingredients. And that's what Israel had to do. And that sort of created an atmosphere, a place where people realize that this is how you have to live. This is how you have to be for this country to be here. So that's, that's really a big part of it. Um, there are other parts like we're a country of immigrants. Uh, just about everybody came to Israel from somewhere else. I came from the United States. Uh, uh, many, either each person is an immigrant or their parents or their grandparents. That pretty much covers everyone. And immigrants are natural entrepreneurs because they have exactly those two characteristics. They, they were determined enough to move from one country to another. They took a risk when they did that. So there's a huge correlation between Im immigrants, diasporas all over the world, and entrepreneurship. Uh, so we're a country of immigrants. But I, the reason, I think you have to sort of feel Startup Nation. I think Strive would agree with this, um, that maybe one way to describe it is, if you go to Hollywood, the waiters there want to be actors, right? Yes, that's true. If you go to New York, maybe they want to be bankers or something. If you go to Israel, all the waiters have an idea for a startup. It's kind of what we do. It's like a national sport. And, we like and, that sport. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. We like it's, that sport. We're not so good at soccer or anything. It's, it's like startups are our national sport. Uh, so, and what's great about that is you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you come to Israel, you'll just get so energized because, you know, being an entrepreneur is lonely. I mean, entrepreneurs are not like other people. They're not like most people. <laughs> they're, and in fact, entrepreneurs are, are in a way more like each other around the world than they are the, the people in their own country. Um, and that's actually very good news because a lot of people ask me, well, they say, well, here we don't like to take risks. That's actually true everywhere. As if, as if I keep hearing in every country I go to, here we don't like to take risks, as if it's unusual in Spain or Korea or whatever. It's actually true everywhere. Entrepreneurs are more, a bit more willing to take risks than other people because they know that nine out of 10 startups fail. And they have that audacity to think that they're going to be the one that does it. And that takes a lot of willingness to take risk. Um, and so th that's what we've kind of learned to do in Israel. Prime Minister, <coughs> startup nation. Can we create a, a startup nation culture to sweep through Africa? I think so. I think it's a, it's, a, it's it's a possibility, but we may not even call it a startup nation. But uh, anything else, uh, we can. Call, why don't you call it a startup centers in one country, for, mm -hmm. one country, for example, and then see how to, it will work, and then you know, I think that can be done. Yeah, we, we we were talking earlier on as we were waiting to come into the room. Mm -hmm. uh, I said to 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 the prime minister, if I had had to go to the bank to borrow money to build a business, I would not be in business. Okay, that what we need is venture capital. Uh, and if you, if, you, if you look, whether you're looking at Silicon Valley or the work in Ch what's happening in China, in Shenzhen, in Israel, and in many other centers, it's unlocking venture capital. Uh, perhaps so you can give us a sense of what we could do over venture capital. So I think that what I see around the world, I see a lot of startup ecosystems, and there's kind of a standard path. Uh, and the first stage is you've got startups but no venture capital. Yeah. I mean, why would there be venture capital? Because there wasn't any, there weren't any startups to invest, to invest in. So the first stage is the startups come out from nowhere. Mm -hmm. And they're bootstrapping and they're trying to get some revenue and, and trying to get 
loans from banks, which I agree is not happening. And then somehow there are the first high profile success stories. Yeah. Like in Israel, we, there's a little company called ICQ uh, that was, uh, it was a chat program in the mid 90s when the internet was barely there. And it somehow went viral. And it was bought by America Online for $400 million. And people saw that. This is a company that had no revenue. It was started by 20 year olds, you know, in their, in their 20s. And people saw this and they said, first of all, in Israel, they said, if those idiots can do it, I can do it. That's right. You know, so it's a tremendous boost for entrepreneurship. Everybody starts thinking, hey, I want to get in the act. And the second thing that happens is venture capital funds start saying, hey, uh, you know, this American company paid serious money for a company in Israel. I better pay attention. I, maybe I'll start a venture fund. So that's, that's the process. And the, the difficulty is, uh, is how do you get that? How do you get those first high profile success stories? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to say something? No, uh, what I want to say is just uh, you talked about two uh, interesting things. The agility, you talked about agility, being ag agile as, as a country, as, a, as people. <clears throat> and then uh, also the way of thinking when you want to turn your idea in a project or, or into a project or into, you know, the, the dream, to make your dream becoming a reality. So that's something very important. But, um, and you say that uh, that agility, which is, uh, uh, which we find in Rwanda is key for our development. And I think this is something we can try to, to, to you know, to, to, to think of and to discuss with our young people, our youth, and uh, to try to be agile in every sector. Here we're talking maybe people will be, think that we'll be talking about agriculture, but in every sector, in every sector we need to have um, agile young people who can uh, be able to, to to, to make sure that uh, their ideas are being are becoming a reality, good project being implemented, and try to you know to to use those in the fund we are trying to put in place like uh, innovation fund and other funds which are being created here in Rwanda. Mm. And and I think uh, two thoughts certainly from my observation uh, we're here to talk about agriculture. So how many agricultural entrepreneurs are here today? Uh, if you are here to talk about banking today or telecoms, I'm not listening. I'm here to talk to agri-entrepreneurs or agripreneurs. I'm only kidding. So who is here as an agripreneur? You know, I heard an interesting statistic today, Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more than 3,000 apps that have been developed in African agriculture, directed towards African agriculture. I, I, I thought that was fantastic. OK, they told me that most of them aren't really working, and a lot of them aren't really making money. But you know, <laughs> uh, Jeff Bezos just became the richest man in the world, and I don't, he only just started making money, right? <laughs> so what's that got to do with it? Uh, but something interesting is stirring in Africa. Young people are beginning to bring innovation to agriculture. The, I said the other day uh, on my Facebook page that if you see someone with a hoe, you should be ashamed. It's an innovation that's 3,000 years old. When are you going to change it? Why don't we come up with a new way to deal with something as simple as a whole? You see, the entrepreneur is the person who doesn't accept what they see as being normal. Don't, don't accept what you see. Just think of the garden hole. Okay? There's nothing romantic about our mothers and our women digging around with hoes while we hold diplomas. Come on, guys, let's get rid of them. 
Okay? You can't say you've got a diploma from an agricultural college when you cannot come up with a solution for a garden, for a hole. We can replace that. Okay, and we will increase productivity. So it's not just about apps. We need more apps. 3,000 isn't good enough. These guys produce that many in a week. Okay, but we need, but it's a, it's a good starting point. But don't just think in terms, apps are great because we think about more efficient ways of doing things. Um, I've spoken about a, 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 a business, um, young, young entrepreneurs in Kenya, so they set up a business called Twiga. I loved the way they, they approached their business model. Okay, they looked at all these market women waking up four o'clock in the morning to go and buy vegetables to sell on the streets of Nairobi. And they said, no, we'll do it. So they go out and they buy the vegetables and they deliver to the women. But now they have warehouses, they have cold storage, okay? They are grading, they are cleaning. These women are waking up now at seven, are getting to their businesses at 7 a.m. Hey, that's fantastic, don't you agree? We should give those guys a shout out, okay? How many other opportunities are there like that? Just dealing with cold storage around vegetables and fruit as we urbanize our cities. It's an entrepreneurial uh, wonderland, okay? So, so we need to bring innovation through to everyday solutions, everyday problems. Don't look at a problem and walk past it. Not if you have a diploma in your pocket. I, I think your mother should clip you around the ear if you go back and she, you see her carrying a bucket on her head and you don't have a solution for it. You know, when I came back from England, from university, my grandmother embarrassed me. She died about um, two years ago at the age of 106. But we had an interesting thing because I had to explain to her what I do. See, I was trained as an electrical engineer. So we kind of sit through and I explained to her. She listened very carefully. Then she called all the women in the village. She said, right, my grandson is back. He is a doctor of electricity. <laughs> He is going to fix you all. All of you are going to have electricity. I said, Grandmother, I'm not the one responsible for it. <laughs> she said, but didn't you just tell me now that you know all about electricity? She said, I want electricity. I have been waiting for you to bring me electricity. My goodness, you know, I, I was afraid to go to that village until I managed to get a little generator and got her going with her electricity. Okay, and I did solve it, you know. Thank God for that. She, she had electricity. But that's how we should all feel about the everyday chores and challenges because that is where entrepreneurship is. So don't look at the problem and complain. Look at the problem and say, I'm doctor of electricity now. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I can't. I don't know how you explain working for, play, for Facebook now to when you get home, you know. What, what do you say? But anyway, that's another story. I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, another way to think of an entrepreneur is um, normal people just see problems. Or maybe they don't see that something is a problem. Like when you see a hole, you're a normal person, you don't think, well, it, you just think that's the way it always been. You don't see it as a problem that can be solved. Entrepreneurs see a problem as an opportunity and as a challenge. Um, but I, I love, I think it's very important the story that you just told about the cold storage yeah. company because I think that, and, and what you were saying about apps, because you know, the, the right way to start is with the right problem, not with the technology. Mm. I think a lot of people, they say, okay, I've got this, I want to do something with drones, right? I, I'm really interested in this technology. I've got this technology now. I'm going to look for a problem to solve with it. 
Well, that's backwards. And in fact, a lot of Israeli startups fail because they do things that way, because Israel is very technology heavy. So you have this amazing inventor, and they come up with a technology that has, they say, oh, what has all so many uses. But if you pick the wrong problem to solve, you're gonna, you don't have a startup. So you start with a problem, and also when you start with the problem, then you use the right amount of technology, maybe none. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically what you described was a business model innovation. Yeah. Refrigerators don't really qualify as technology. No. <laughs> I mean, you think also, uh, was talking to someone here who said, you know, Israel makes drip irrigation, a uh, big drip irrigation country, company that's gone all over the world. And drip irrigation can sometimes double yields here, or even, depending on the crop, eight times increase. But the challenge is how do you get it adopted? Mm. How do you get the mindset that would invest the money? How do you figure out the uh, financial inclusion that will allow that to happen? And drip irrigation is not high tech. Mm. So the, the problem I think often is not technology because we're having trouble even getting very simple things adopted. So the, the innovation comes in the business models that get people to adopt new things. And, 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 and that's so true. I mean, take, take for instance um, seeds. You know, I chair uh, Agra. Um, and one of the most, you know, when, when, I, when I took up the role of, when I joined the board of Agra, I, I was a little reticent, because I'm not a farmer, you know, I'm a, I'm a techie. <laughs> and um, I kept thinking, you know, I hope they don't ask me to, to solve anything, you know, because I don't know what to do. But anyway, we kind of go to, uh, we started this program in Agra, of the agro dealers, okay? Because we, we were introducing seeds, hybrid seeds, mm. into rural Africa, where they had not used seeds before. They, they had legacy seeds, so you kept seeds from the previous uh, harvest and you planted those. But of course, that's does not give you the yield as the experts in agriculture will tell you. What you need is properly developed hybrid seeds. But, so, but the technology is there. So the seed is there. I mean, there's nothing new in that. It's a technology. But getting the adaptation going, how do we persuade these people to take it up? Now, for a long time, governments came up with things like extension officers, and they had guys doing field trials and what have you. But I went to Mali with uh, Kofi Annan, and there were these women who were the agro-dealers. And, and they had to sell these seeds, and they had become incredibly innovative in demonstrating, in, they, they, you needed to watch those women sell those seeds. And suddenly Mali was moving, okay? The, so, you, it, so it wasn't just the technology. And now, we, then the moment I saw that, I said, right, that's the piece that we were looking for, the entrepreneurs. I can recognize these women. These are entrepreneurs. What else could we do with them? <laughs> because now you've got a whole ecosystem beginning to emerge in rural Africa. And some people started using these women to sell, okay, when you're demonstrating that to rural people how to uh, plant seed, they're gonna make money, right? Why don't you try and sell them a cell phone? <laughs> So now they were carrying recharge cards for phones and they were carrying soap. And, and, and so, so entrepreneurship builds, is not just a question of technology. It's just it's the business models that you need to also develop. But perhaps the time has come for us to get our entrepreneurs involved. 
Prime Minister, you want to say something first before we get into... Yes, thank you. Um, what I want to add is um, we're talking about entrepreneurship, we're talking about young people, we're talking about being agile and do things. And this means uh, being result-oriented. You cannot be innovator if you're not result-oriented. And that's something very important for our youth, for our young people. Uh, <clears throat> and as you said, uh, I think we have a good example of uh, some Rwandan young people. Uh, I think uh, 15 years ago, you couldn't find someone who is a university graduate go and do agriculture in your area in Rwanda. Everyone would be looking for a job from the government, from private sector, but uh, being a university graduate and go to practice agriculture was not uh, really um, uh, a way of thinking for young people. But now, when I, I look at uh, all groups which are doing agriculture in Rwanda, we, you will find some agriculture engineers, some people who are economists, who have a degree in economics, but who want to do really agriculture. And we have some examples in different provinces of Rwanda. And for us, this shows that uh, I mean, our young people are changing their mindset. And that's very important. And you can find some of them in this room, in this meeting room. We found some agriculture engineers uh, who have been uh, at Rwanda University doing agriculture science or economics or other, other field, but who are doing now agriculture. The other thing I want to talk about is uh, when you talk about the agriculture sector, it's, uh, it's a really a value chain. And the way you, the way you, st you have to choose where you start as, as, you know, as, a, as a start in agriculture. I was starting by intervening in producing uh, seeds, fertilizers, or just producing uh, agricultural commodities, or just uh, agro-processing. When you have a select the way where you are going to start, it's when you, you start to think about your, your, your contribution to agricultural sector. And, uh, and when you think, as you said, about the solution, you have to go there, think I'm going there because there is a problem to solve, and then you find yourself as a problem solver, as a young person in an agriculture sector. This is what I want to add. To add. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, um, it's about you guys now. Let me introduce you to my friends, Prime Minister. These are my friends. They come from my... we talking to each other every day on my platform. Three and a half million of them. So I have a lot of friends here. <laughs> and let me tell you about my friends. A lot of millionaires billionaires, you see them? That's what they look like. I can see that. <laughs> you see them? Do you see them? Do you want? Who are the billionaires? Put up your hands. See? Have you ever seen so many? This is your, this, this is your tax, Prime Minister. This is where the money is going to come from. Very interesting. They're going to build roads. They're going to build schools. So let's talk. We're going to pick up some questions from you guys. Uh, let's spread them around. Let's learn. Let's discuss. Uh, my friend over there. Thank you Introduce very much. Introduce yourself. Tell us what you're doing to change Rwanda or Africa. Thank you very much. My name is Titila Femi Kings, and uh, I am from Nigeria. And I believe we are discussing Africa, not just uh, Rwanda. Uh, That's right. Thank you very much, sir. Um, there is a contrast in the picture of youth coming to agriculture that we are working on. What we are working on here now that we're calling agribusiness. Somewhere in the beginning, sir, there is a problem we are not attending. Here now we want to call it agribusiness, we want the youth to come. But sir, my primary school textbook calls a farmer a dirty person. And you killed my perception from there. My secondary school teacher calls agriculture punishment. <laughs> See, it's not, it's funny, but it touches me. So, perception is, has been killed from the beginning. And suddenly, you want to call it a business. Football is not treated like that. Ordinary football. A young person, seven years old, five years old, is aspiring for football, sees a zero now door ahead of him that he wants to be like, and nobody's calling the punishment for him. So, sir, can we come up with policies that will tell no school should ever punish a child with cutting of grass because that is the beginning of agriculture. Thank you. No textbook. No textbook. I tried to do this with the Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria before. I came at Shino, but I didn't know where it got to. And this is what I am doing in, uh, in Nigeria. The social dimension of agriculture. Going back to the primary school, going back to the secondary school. I have a lot to talk about this, but so that others can talk. Thank you. Perception needs to change 
before you call it a business, make it attractive to the young one. And that is what my organization is doing, called Transforming the Face of Agriculture in Nigeria. I rest my case. Thank you. Maybe I can add something. Yeah. Would you like to, to yeah. say yeah. something yeah. Yeah. about... About what he's saying. About what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Now, thank you so much. Uh, what I want to say is that, uh, of course, there is that uh, perception which has been in Africa for a long time, where people think that if you fail at school, you become a farmer. And, uh, and uh, people would say, okay, because you have failed at school, you go back to the village. And going back to the village means to become a farmer. And that, that's the wrong perception, of course, and we, I, I'm supporting what you were saying, that we need to change that perception and tell people uh, and educate our people, telling them that agriculture is a business like other businesses you can do. From the beginning, as I said, from the, 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 the first step of value chain, produce seed, produce fertilizer, going to agriculture production, then agro processing, and so on and so on. So this is what I want to, to mention. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, I'm going to turn on this side, the, the, the lady at the front here. Please keep it uh, short, and let's not make it too much about comments, because we want to learn and share ideas. Good evening, sir. My name is Blessing Machia and I'm an entrepreneur from Zimbabwe. My company focuses on, post, on avoiding post-harvest losses for farmers. In the past three and a half weeks, myself and 15 go-getters have been going through some very rigorous training on how to run our startups. And from then, I've learned that the poverty that we have in Africa is actually poverty of the mind and not poverty of resources. We have ample resources, but it's how we take those, that knowledge and to use it to the best of our advantage. That is where we are lacking. So my question to you, sir, is um, how best can we unlock the minds of the smallholder farmer, the minds of the rural person to know that why it's what they have in their hands that will bring a change and not necessarily looking for solutions from outside thank you thank you i think um can you comment on that uh sure i was going to take a few more because there are a few, ah, okay. quite a few Sorry. people here so let's we've taken that one i'm going to take the lady just behind you there she's so eager go on Okay, so talking about perception, I think um, youths need to realize that agriculture... My name is Modupe Oyetosho from Nigeria. Youths need to realize that agriculture is a business. When I started farming four years ago, I started with one hectare because that was what I could afford. And I couldn't get tractors to work on my farm. I couldn't get access to drone and, uh, you know, latest technology and all that. So it was, growth was difficult for me and it was slow. So I saw your post when you said that you were talking about rural farmers getting access to technology instead of capital investment. So that um, little subscription and so it hit me that, okay, if there's a way we can get access. And so I started co-working space for farming. It's an estate with irrigation, uh, with um, drones, with soy sensors. So as a young farmer, you want to start a farm, you just come subscribe for a space, you get access to all these, and you can start small and grow big. So to validate it, I started with 100 hectares, and right now we have more farmers, more youths that we can even provide service for right now. So what I'm saying now is that when you realize that agriculture is a business, that you'll be thinking about growth, so you have to invest in um, business education. It's not just about farming. It's not just about agriculture. But investing also in how do I know more about business? Like, and that's why I follow your post. Most of, most of my business model, I can trace it back to most of the posts on, on your post on Facebook. So it's about following leaders in business and thinking of, because it's business in agriculture. That's and right. that's how you can grow into agribusiness. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to come swing around this side. So hold on to that question that you've got to answer because you promised to answer it. Young man. I hope you don't mind being called young man. You can call me young man. I, I like that. Thank you. Um, my name is Jacques Preveru Manika. Um, I don't think I can ask a question because I'm the one to bring answers. 
Uh, I'm from Rwanda because my former professor is just sitting right there. <laughs> um, thank you very much. I think this is a, it's an honor to be a part of this forum and uh, to learn from you guys. We follow you. Um, but also my worry from all the discussion we had this morning as we were preparing for this forum is we still need to see the, flux, the, of the influx of people, earth, young people who are going through different sectors. Let's talk about agriculture only. We have, it's, a value, it's a whole value chain. But how many people from those who went to school actually to learn agriculture, like engineers like myself, who go back actually to do the, the hard work? Let's call it the hard work. And if we change the perception by showing those who succeeded <coughs> on these pages of uh, WFP, uh, FAO, than showing those young people who are suffering, plowing, and actually show people who succeeded, this will change the perception. There are few people who are going back to do the, hard, the, 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 the true work. Because agriculture, it's summarized on farming. Farming, which is to make sure the cow went to, eat, to have grass, to have water, and salt. To put, actually, the beans in the ground and grow it and follow it until you yield something. That's everything is supporting that concept, which is to produce food that we eat, that we need to sustain our lives. Thank you. So if we cannot really create that, if we can give a solution to dive into that, then Everything that is software, no one is willing to work on the hardware side of life. Appreciate Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we're going to take one more. And I want to go for, I want to go to the back of the room. The, young, the gentleman with the checkered shirt. Go on. Still a young man. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for the forum. My name is Karumba Kinyua. I come from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm, I run a firm called Pine Hill Consulting. My, uh, my question is, when I talk to my clients who need money, they tell me that there's no money. When I come here, I hear people telling me there's a lot of money coming to agriculture. And Thrive, you've, you've, you know that uh, in the tech space is attracting a lot of funding. Even early startup or you know, Series A, B, and that's the language they talk there. How can we convert the narrative so that the money that we hear about reaches the to the startups and the small agri-farmers agri in the rural village so that we make the narrative of the IT and startup the same for agribusiness because that's where most of our people work. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'm going to start with your question by coming to Seoul. So um, when I did my learning trip to your country, uh, what, I, what I noticed, particularly when I visited Startup Nation, a central, those, those guys working, was the importance they placed on information for entrepreneurs. Because at the center of whatever we do is creating an ecosystem which allows entrepreneurs to be informed, to be informed about training, to be informed about finance, uh, just m give us some of your thoughts, and I know you want to answer the other question, the comment that was made, but I, I think this could be some learning for us. So why do nine out of ten startups fail, whether it's in Israel or Silicon Valley or, or anywhere? Uh, there, I think the reason is that you have to get everything right. You have to have the right team. You have to be solving the right problem. You have to have the right timing, which is not in your control. You, uh, you have to do sales, marketing, management, hiring, everything. So th that's another way of saying it's not about the idea. It's so many other things. Um, so that takes learning. There's a lot of, and what's good is that there's there's so much um, information, very uh, available training, how to do startups online. Uh, I mean, there are accelerators everywhere now with, whose job it is to, uh, to try to train new entrepreneurs. Um, you know, a simple thing like pitch, as they call it a pitch clinic. Mm. How do you describe your startup in one minute if you're trying to raise money for it, you have to be able to talk about it. Uh, in fact, the first job of the entrepreneur, really, when you think about it, is to convince one person that their idea isn't crazy. 
and it's convinced someone to join their team. And that's a matter of pitching. Um, so, yeah, this can be learned. Uh, and spreading, spreading, you know, knowledge from a system, a big mature system like Israel. There's just a lot of a lot of experience there. I, I think, actually, you know, a lot of people focus on Silicon Valley. Um, and Silicon Valley is great, but it's not so interested in the rest of the world, I think. Yeah, and, and that's an interesting point. Um, you know, my next town hall is in Khartoum. I'll be in Khartoum on Sunday, and I'll meet a group just like this one. I go to learn, just as I learn to be. And what I find, I, I'm always saying to my people, okay, so what is best practice? What's happening in Pakistan? But do you know what's happening in Philippines? and Indonesia. I mean, you've got to open your mind to looking around the world. You guys have an, an extraordinary tool in your hand, that, that smartphone. I bet you all have a smartphone, right? I mean, you can check up anything, okay? Any idea you have, you can go around the world. I mean, when, when, we, when we made that learning tour to, to, to Israel, I mean, we, we, we went to one place, and they lined up entrepreneurs in agriculture with startup companies all day. It was bewildering. There were the things people were doing, okay? And they were saying, we're looking for partners, okay? I, 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 I had a team out in Indonesia a couple of weeks ago to go and look at mobile financial technologies. Again, young people showing us different ideas. They were looking for partners. Let's do something together. Let's connect together. So we should, you should be doing this on a daily basis. Not only reaching out to other nations, but even in Africa itself. The number of things that are going on on this continent would stagger you. So, so one of the things we need to do is entrepreneurs who begin to work in this space of the flow of information. As my co uh, friend there said, okay, I come here and I hear there's a lot of money. But when I'm in Nairobi, I'm told there's no money. Well, that's an opportunity for an entrepreneur to fix. Do you know that? If somebody fixes that, how do we get the flow of information? Because some of you should become the financiers, should become the venture capitalists should become the guys who mobilize the funding uh, to get something done. Because that too is entrepreneurship. So uh, I, I think that's a, that's a great point. Coming back, uh, uh, Prime Minister, do you want to pick up any of the comments or questions that came from that string of questions? Uh, maybe just to share with our colleagues here uh, some Rwandan experience about young people. Actually, we have, uh, maybe I'll ask my, our, our Rwandan Minister of Agriculture to explain better than me because she's the uh, one who is managing that sector. But uh, we have, uh, I'm just sharing that experience. We have uh, <coughs> some agricultural engineers who come from Israel, actually. It's a group of them, it's a team of them. And when they come back from Israel, uh, they joined rural cooperatives. First of all, it was just to help those cooperatives to, 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 you know, to achieve their results, to do agriculture and uh, uh, to help them in different activities in terms of technology and, and so on. But they end up by asking those cooperatives to be members of those cooperatives. Now those young people, they, I don't think they want, they want to come back and, uh, and look for a job. They have already their job. They have created their job over there. So that was uh, something I want to share with you. And uh, maybe... Sure, definitely yeah. prime. We'll take a few more questions. But, but again, you know, you go back to Saul's earliest question about competitive advantages. You know, uh, we, the, the late Kofi Annan and us, we went to Holland. And we, I mean, if you think, my, if you think Rwanda is small, the Netherlands is also very small. 
but they have, what, a 60 billion, 100 billion dollar agriculture industry. In a, you know, I say about Holland, it's so small that if you doze while you're driving, by the time you wake up, you're in Belgium. And, and so how have they approached it? Well, obviously, they're not growing wheat. They're not big enough for wheat. They're not big enough for maize. But somebody said to me there, you know, uh, some of the seed, tomato seed they produce is of such high value that a kg of the seed is worth more than a kg of gold. Okay? So, so your country might look small. The, you, an acre might look small. But in future, I believe Rwanda will be the center of horticulture, of the most high value horticulture in, in this region. Because your competitive advantage. Okay? So don't look at what. You say, oh, we don't have enough land. Then you're not an entrepreneur. You have enough land. Okay? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Okay? These guys started exporting fruit. But I thought they were in the desert. Okay? So how did that happen? <laughs> okay. So that's uh, kind of a funny story because Israel's just celebrated its 70th anniversary. And, you know, for many years, Startup Nation is about 25 years old. But before that, the, the pride of our country was making the desert green and selling oranges. <laughs> our big export was oranges. And in fact, if you see a graph of Israeli exports, it goes like this, those are the oranges, then high tech kicks in. <laughs> And, but the, the, the people early on who started doing tech in Israel, the, the people said, well, wh what, what's that? You know, why are you doing tech? That's not what we do. And uh, so it, it was a change in mindset uh, that somehow, uh, you know, happened, that allowed that to happen going from, uh, you know, a, a country that grew, grows oranges to a country that grows high tech. <laughs> And keep thinking about those opportunities. Let's have some more questions. Uh, there's a lady over there. Prime Minister, come. Let's pick them out. I think so. You've been, get up and ask us your question. Good afternoon. My name is Lele Matseke and I'm from a development finance institution in South Africa. And we finance agriculture. Um, I was just listening to what you were saying, Mr. Masu, about the fact that some of us need to become financiers, right? And my role is effectively assessing a lot of applications and really spotting where the opportunities lie. Sometimes I tend to feel unsupported because uh, when I joined the organization, I, I, I started asking the question, I get that it's not bankable, but what do we have to do in order to make it bankable? And I tend to think that what... what Oh, in fact, my question is, how do we make it possible for individuals like myself, who are now tasked with finding opportunities and enabling an entrepreneurs to get financing, how do we make it possible for us to get exposure and to be able to you know, have that higher risk profile in order to assess these um, applications and these opportunities and move them forward where they should be getting financing? Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Who said there was no money? Yeah, you see. There is money. There is money. But the individuals <laughs> who are actually assessing these, these opportunities don't have the skills. I appreciate that. And, but this is exactly what we're talking about. Let's build an African network. A network. You, come on, you guys. You've got WhatsApp groups. And I, I, I know sometimes I watch my daughters, you know. You know, the other day, one of them primes that came up to me and she said, you know, I'm looking for some advice. I said, to do what? Your homework? She said, no, I've started a company. <laughs> says, so I couldn't say anything because I've been telling these guys to start companies. So that one isn't going to get a job. She's decided at, at 16 that she's going to start a company. In fact, she's registered it already. Mm -hmm. You know, so, but that's our future. Okay, another of my daughters before she graduated, I mean... I said, so what are you going to do now? She said, no, no, you know, a few, we've already started. A, she, she introduced me to the whole idea of crowdfunding, and I had to be part of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very expensive. <laughs> but anyway, um, 
questions. Let's have some more questions. Let's go far, far. What's at the back of the room? Come on. Thank you. My name is Inyo Doshima Jedoni from Rwanda. I'm a farmer. So, Strev, I agree with you that, that of course we should start with, begin with ideas. But I remember five or four years ago, there was a report that more than 70% of the youth projects, they fail. They, they, they fail within the starting points. We fail as youth. So, Strive, you are, you, of course, you are successful. What, what, are, what are the way to follow? What are your advice to follow for, for those young people who are willing to start business or especially agribusiness? So what are your way that, or your tips that we should follow? Thank you. 70% is a great statistic. Didn't you hear Israel? 90% fail. Okay, so don't worry about the 70%. Listen, <laughs> failure is part of the game, okay? In fact, an entrepreneurial nature, one of the definitions of an entrepreneurial nation is how comfortable it is with failure. Do you want me to repeat that? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with failure. I mean, I'll give you an example. I had a, a venture a couple of years ago. Some of you will know the venture wanted to get into insurance. So I had huge fights with my executives. And I, I like them to fight with me. And they come to me and we, we have discussions about insurance. But I had an idea that I wanted them to solve. Okay, somebody came to me and said that they needed, they, uh, someone, it was in South Africa where I lived at the time, and an African guy from Zimbabwe died. And his family wanted his body repatriated. And I said, so, um, so we give them some money. But then I said, but why can't there be an insurance solution to this? Why can't this guy have bought insurance for 20 cents or 50 cents or a dollar? Even he was a god. Okay, so out of it came a business we called Ecolife. Okay, so we developed a funeral plan that cost, and it was a spectacular failure. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, it was a spectacular failure because what happened, we got the business model wrong. And we had a million customers on this thing, okay? and we were making huge losses. It could bring the whole house down. So I shut it down. Okay, and people screamed, how can Strive, I see why do this to us? I said, don't care, I'm not gonna lose money on it, okay? So we shut it down, but we didn't go away. It would take us two to three years before we returned. During that time, there'd been some hard, hard lessons. Let me tell you, you couldn't buy that business off me for a billion dollars today. The insurance part of our business. I've had offers for it. People have approached me. One guy flew from the US, meet me in London and said, this thing you're doing insurance, can we do it? I said, you're late my friend, I'm doing it. <laughs> by myself and I don't need you, okay? So failure is not a problem. Don't be ashamed, embarrassed, anything like that, because entrepreneurship has to be comfortable with failure, okay? It's part and parcel of the game. So don't be worried about that. You hear 70% of the, that's a pretty good statistic, okay? Uh, we can get it down. So that is why we talk of venture capital rather than bank loans. You need venture capital because venture capital anticipates failure. They don't expect most of the guys they help to succeed. But the ones that succeed make up for those that lost. That's how they make their money. Okay, so we need more like the young lady from South Africa to emerge as venture capitalists and financiers 
of the businesses that we are doing. That is a whole industry missing in our ecosystem. And I'm appealing to the Prime Minister to say, Startup Nation Rwanda, let's get Africa's first real venture capital industry going here. That will become the light on a shining on a hill for the rest of the continent. I, I'm happy to help, and Saul will help me, help you. <laughs> Let's have some more questions. I'm going to... Okay. Sir. Hi, my name is uh, Nobat Haguma. I'm Rwandan, but I'm uh, speaking here today on behalf of a Pan-African organization called Africa Gen. Uh, which is uh, trying to mobilize one million Africans to work for the development of our continent. So I'm not really making a comment, I'm more like making a pitch because we're looking for a champion for our cause. So what we're trying to do is uh, to create a new uh, model for, um, for paying services of uh, uh, restoring ecosystems. So in Africa, I think we have about 100 million hectares of land which has been degraded and which needs restoration. Before we even talk about agriculture, there's a lot of land that needs to be uh, put back into a working uh, situation. So what happens is that uh, there are methods like uh, carbon trading, which unfortunately ignores completely Africa. I think there's only one or two percent of the total carbon credits in the world which come to Africa. And when you look, the reason why this is not happening is because we lack the infrastructure, the trained professionals, and the, infra and the processes which would allow our uh, farmers, our volunteers, our youth to actually uh, fix the continent and get money which is coming from abroad and which is a, dignit a dignified form of money. It's not aid, it's not anything like that. So we are organizing a hackathon next month to actually try and solve this. We have already established, uh, most of us are programmers, so we have already established the skeleton of what this platform will look like, but we're inviting other Africans to come and on board and help us build it, and we're making it open source. So that, like you said earlier, there's not 3,000 different apps for this, but we can have apps that are interconnected and they can speak to each other. Great. Thank you. I loved your pitch. Two million Africans just listened to you on Facebook. So, hey man, you're doing well. Thank you. Great pitch. Um, my brother at the back, I, I want to I wanna get to a lady, because sometimes these guys just get ahead of you, right? <laughs> the lady in the back there, come, 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 jump up. And where did I, I heard you, so you're next. What's happened to our mic? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tululok Wainno. Where are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> My name is Tolulope Aino, and I'm the CEO of Tolulope Foods and Farms, which is situated in Abeokuta, Nigeria. Well, basically, my business is about um, creating solutions along the cassava and the maize value chain through increased youth participation, inclusion. Basically, I graduated from the University of Ibadan. I have background in agricultural economics. And sadly, I would say about just 1% of graduates of agriculture actually venture into agribusinesses. I've been into this sector even while I was an undergraduate at the university. And even after graduating, I've consistently been in the industry. Definitely, I believe what I've come to understand over time is that if the environments were more enabling, if we had access to more developmental partners, we had um, technical support from relevant institutions. I wouldn't have made so much losses and mistakes as I have made over time. But then I accept those and I've grown and I understand how it works better now. Appreciate it. You got so, a point? Yes. So basically what I'm working on now is using the farm integration model. The farm integration model brings in youth, we need developmental partners, as I've said, to actually develop the value chain. So youth don't keep on making 
mistakes that are unnecessary. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. I'm visiting your part of the world. I'm coming to see President of Barsanjo's farm next week. Isn't that near where you are? Abiyokuta. Ah, uh, you see, I come to Nigeria. I love Nigeria. Whoa, so many entrepreneurs. The place brims with entrepreneurs. Look, you know, remember what I've said to you often on Facebook. You know, the entrepreneur is like a soldier. You do not fight the conditions, you fight in the conditions. You know, because it's going to be different. The guy in Sierra Leone, the guy in Rwanda, the guy... Okay, we can spend all day talking about the challenges in our environment, but we must be like the soldier who says, you know what, come rain or shine, I must fight. Okay, that's what entrepreneurship is about. You know, we... we I was discussing the other day um, the challenge, the shortage of eggs. Ambassador Quinn, one of the greatest men on this planet. I, I want to shout you out, sir. You are one of the greatest entrepreneurs. He set up the Hunger Prize in Iowa. Everybody wants that prize. We've even We've even given it to Agnes, haven't you? I mean, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. Please just say hello to our young people. <laughs> Ambassador Quinn and I were talking about roads in rural areas and the impact of building roads in rural areas. But I want to come back. Eggs. If every child under the age of 12, had an egg, Prime Minister. We would cut stunting by 50%. And yet in some of our countries, 70% of the eggs are being imported. Where are our entrepreneurs? Come on, guys, it's difficult to grow eggs. I'll buy eggs from you. What we need to do is to create an ecosystem that allows us to develop a poultry industry. The other day, uh, yeah, uh, in one of the Nigerian universities uh, produced an, uh, an incredible indigenous chicken that was unveiled, that has all the productivity, produces the eggs, produ can live in that environment. I mean, these are, but I want to challenge you. What about eggs? Will we import eggs? and beef, and chicken. I think we want to import and trade with some India and Brazil, but please, not with eggs and chickens. We don't, we can, well, it's time to, we want to attract as may be today, but not eggs and chickens. Do we agree? So next time we talk, no more importing eggs. Okay, is it done? I heard you. Tell us about what you're going to do. Thank you so much, Sam, for the opportunity once again. Um, I'm actually almost blushing because I have the same opportunity one year ago to talk to you about coffee. I'm excited about what you're saying about eggs because I have a business partner who just started a poultry farm in Ghana and he bought a thousand chicks. And it already started. I think they are about to lay, getting ready for the Christmas um, season for it to be sold. So we are going out, getting more people, hotels, um, companies, poultry farmers, and local sellers to buy the eggs. So we are on course, sir. Thank you. I'll buy eggs from you. Done, sir. I'll, I'll make sure that you supply the eggs, sir. Thank okay. you. <laughs> well done. We promised you. Come on up. Thank you. I'm Garambe Scovia from Rwanda. My company produces organic fertilizer from chicken waste. I produce chicken meat and eggs. And also, I'm head of livestock in Rwanda Youth in Agribusiness Forum. My concern is most of youth 
have started agribusiness. But the effort to lift us up who have started is limited so that you can be a role model for our peers. Um, I would like to ask which plans do you have for us without telling us to go to banks where they will ask us collateral yet we don't have. Thank you. Prime Minister, that one is for you. <laughs> <laughs> she has started. Isn't she amazing? Yes, that's very interesting. But um, she's asking which, what is the plan you have for them. Um, and she's trying also, as you said, to avoid the bank. Um, I may not have direct answer right now because maybe she can come and discuss with us to know her, the kind of business she's doing. And uh, what we do, I will tell our Minister of, our Minister of Agriculture to, she can come and meet her and then um, explain the kind of business she's doing and which kind of assistance they need. Because you have different founders, I said, uh, some money for cooperatives, some money for, you know, but we need to know in details what you are doing as a business. So what I'm going to do is just to, to tell you to go and see the Minister of Agriculture who is here. And the then, Minister of Agriculture, stand up. And then uh, yeah. see, I'm sure she will tell you diff different ways you can, uh, you can um, do your business. I mean, find fundings, uh, uh, maybe not from the bank, but other ways. So this is what I can... Thank you so much. You know, our time is running out, guys. We could be here all night. You know that. You know, uh, the Minister of Agriculture of, of Rwanda is, is one of my favorite people in all the world. She's such a great partner. You know, because it's not just about... Obviously, there are practical things that you can try to do. But it's about policy. Okay. This is the largest uh, uh, agraf since we started more than 10 years ago. When we first started in, in, uh, in Accra, Ghana with uh, Kofi Annan, the whole conference was about the size of this room. Okay, and we said there's going to be a, a... Today, one of the biggest challenges we have is at the end of this conference, the partners, the alliance partners who form the AGRAF have to consider bids from countries that want to host the conference. We have a long queue and I go hiding <laughs> because they lobby. It's a fight. Rwanda won this one and boy, you've, built, you've, you've done a showcase, man. You give, give yourself a hand. <laughs> I, I love what you have done. And let me tell you, as I've walked in the corridors, uh, Prime Minister, one of the, it, is, it is some of the people that are here. I mean, some of the greatest minds and policy makers and entrepreneurs in the field of ag, they're just wandering through your corridors. Every, everywhere I go, I, I've been seeing text messages from people who have come literally from all over the world. I just bumped into a, a colleague I met a, a little while ago. He said, he's from Brazil. He said, I've come for the conference. We could have had 10,000 people at this conference. So we, we really appreciate uh, the warmth the, 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 and the opportunity to come here. And it, and it was great that we were able to come here in the year that Rwanda is, has the leadership mantle in Africa. With, with President Kagame working tirelessly uh, as leader of the African Union this year. And, and you've, you've made a great showcase. That's why we are here. We're proud to be here. Uh, we can't answer every question. You know, that's supposed to be a conversation. Uh, it's, it's my great privilege to be here and to, uh, to be able to spend this time with you. Uh, I want you... There's a reason I asked Saul Singer to come. His book is phenomenal. I, I read it, you know, I, I, you've never heard me recommend to you many books, but this is one to be read. Saul Singer, thank you, my dear friend. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. 
this book is a, it's a little book. Uh, the amount of internet reading you do in a week, you will clear Saul's book in a few days. But it will change your life. And to our agri-entrepreneurs, the opportunity of African agriculture is here and now. Seize it before another. Literally, if you don't, someone else will. Because Africa is going to feed itself. Africa is going to be the center of feeding the world. Okay, we are the center. <laughs> Africa is the youth of the world. Our average age is 19. Okay, more than 50% of the world's young people are already Africans. Okay, and it will be so to the turn of the century and beyond. We are the footballers, we are the artists, we are the singers, and we are the farmers. Now go out and grow the food. Thank you. Bless you, Prime Minister. Do you want to make some final remarks? Do you want to make a final remark? Oh, thank you so much. I think you have uh, covered everything. But uh, what I want to say to our colleagues here, our young entrepreneurs, oh. is that um, being an entrepreneur and, uh, or entrepreneurship in general is... Uh, is uh, trying to think out of the box, to be innovative, of course, and uh, to be result-oriented, and uh, to try some unconventional ways of doing things, because this is why you become an entrepreneur. Otherwise, there's no formula of becoming an entrepreneur. It's just try to, to work in an unconventional way, and then you find a solution to a problem you have identified. And then uh, the, other, the other special um, thing we need to think we need, we think we need in Africa is uh, networking. I said it in the previous session I attended. Our young people, we were not good in networking. People would have, would be holding information in Rwanda, where there's someone in Ghana who, who could have a solution, but you don't have it. So networking is the key. And uh, I'm told that network is not uh, African culture, but we need to learn that culture and be able to do, to do our networking between our young entrepreneurs. And uh, this, this is why you have, the, the only way you can have uh, information about what you are doing and then succeed. And again, uh, before I conclude, I want to, to, yeah, yeah, to support what you said. Uh, don't be afraid of, you know, to fail in a business is normal. It's, it's kind of becoming, becoming an adventure. So when you're doing business, you can fail once, twice, by the third time we succeed. So this is what you have to know. And um, all economists here, they know that, or business people, you can fail once, but the second time you succeed. So uh, it's a matter of, uh, you know, having information, being innovative, and um, being result oriented, as, as I said. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so, so. I don't think uh, we can end this session without uh, me trying to share the secret for Rwanda to become a startup nation. Okay. Simple secret. We better take notes quickly. Okay. Secret is, don't do it alone. It's what you were saying about networking. This region, the countries of this region, should think of themselves as one country when it comes to innovation. One big startup ecosystem. Yeah. The, the, the countries that try to do it alone will not grow as fast as the ones that are connected to other ecosystems. And one of the powerful things I actually heard in Rwanda, say at the uh, Kigawe Innovation City, they wanted to be pan-African. They want everybody to come there. So if, if this region is one innovation country, then the question is, what's the capital of that country? Is it Nairobi, is it Kigawe? Which, which country is going to perform the function of being the hub for the region that tries to connect to everybody in the region. And if this region is an innovation country, it can be the hub for Africa. Yeah, that's, that's profound. That's profound. You know, I, for the last 20 years, I have forced myself to not to see borders. When I look at a business that I'm developing, 
I st and someone comes, okay, where are we starting? They say, oh, we're starting this one in Kigali. So when will we get to Addis? When will we get to Accra? When will we get to Anjamen? We've just built um, a fiber optic network. Um, but this next week, I'm on my way to Egypt, is we are commissioning the, the fiber optic link between Cape Town and um, Cairo. 60,000 kilometers. But I can tell you by, that by the end of, before Christmas, I'll commission our fiber optic network from Djibouti to a place called Kilibe. Who knows where Kilibe is? It's next to Douala in the Aounde, in, in uh, Cameroon. Think cities, don't think nations. We are too small to think nations, but we are big enough to think cities. So on that note, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for all those who have stayed with us online. And um, have a nice evening. God bless you.